Hello and welcome to Cicerone Live. Um, I'm Amy Hodkin and thanks for joining us for our April live event uh, where we'll be discussing the Camino de Santiago Camino Frances, a pilgrimage route in Spain with Cicerone author Sandy Brown and Camino expert Ivar Recve. Um, Sandy is going to start us off with a presentation all about the Camino Frances and then I'll move on to asking Ivar some questions about what it's like to be in Santiago de Compostela at the moment. And Ivar's also got some beautiful photos of the cathedral renovations uh, that we're looking forward to sharing with you. So it should be a really special event this evening. Um, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, you can write questions uh, for Sandy and Ivar in the comments. Or if you're watching on the Cicerone website, you can email live at cicerone.co.uk. And my colleague Hannah is managing all of that behind the scenes and we're going to try and get through as many of your questions as we possibly can. Um, and this event will also be available to watch back on the Cicerone website, YouTube channel and Facebook page. So it's available if you need to leave at any point um, or if you really enjoy the event and you want to share it with someone who isn't able to watch it live. Um, all of our other previous live events are also available on the Cicerone website, www w.cicerone.co.uk forward slash live and are also available as highlights on our podcast www.cicerone.co.uk forward slash podcast um, and information about that will be on banners along the bottom throughout the event um, also there will be a banner um, about the discount that we're running for Sandy's guidebook to the Camino de Santiago Camino Frances so if you order on the Cicerone website, you can get 25% off the full price of that guidebook by using the discount code SANTIAGO25 at the checkout. Um, the guidebook comes with a full map booklet of the route, which includes the locations of places to stay, get refreshments, and lots more helpful information uh, for walking this pilgrimage route. Um, so to introduce our guests, Sandy Brown is Cicerone's associate publisher for Caminos and Pilgrimages. He has walked or biked over 10,000 kilometers of pilgrim trails in Europe and the US. He is the author of Cicerone's guidebook to the Camino de Santiago Camino Frances, which we'll be talking about today, as well as Cicerone's guide to the Way of St. Francis and Cicerone's new and upcoming guidebooks to the Via Francigena, a pilgrimage route in Italy. Sandy records his pilgrim adventures on his popular blog, www.caminoist.org, and he is currently walking the California Mission Trail as research for a future Cicerone guidebook to that 814-mile trail. Um, he's going to talk to us today about the Camino Frances, which he has walked or biked four times since 2008, most recently in 2019. And our second guest is Eva Recve who has been running the Camino Forum for almost 17 years. And you can find that at www.caminodesantiago.me forward slash community. The forum has accumulated almost 60,000 Camino questions with around 90,000 members. And seven years ago, he also started the Camino Forum store, um, www.santiagodecompostela.me, selling guidebooks and other items related to the Camino de Santiago. Um, Ivar joins us tonight from Santiago and is able to give us brilliant insights into the changes that have occurred since international pilgrims have been able to visit, particularly renovations um, of the cathedral. And we've got those photos coming up for you. Um, so I'm going to add Sandy and Ivar to the stream now um, and get up Sandy's slides um, so that he can start our presentation. So hello, both of you. Thank you so much for Hi. joining us. Hi there. Hi, Amy. Hi, Ivar. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Sandy, you're going to start us off with a presentation all about the Camino Frances. Um, so, there we go. There's your first slide. Excellent. Uh, so, yeah, take it away. Thank you so much, Amy. And it's really a privilege to be able to be here and to share with this audience about pilgrimage. And I want to start with just a kind of an overview of what pilgrimage is. Some people worry or wonder if this is a walk or a bike trip for religious purposes, or if it's a spiritual event, or if it's a recreational event. And I want to say that it's really all three things all together. And actually, I want to call on one of my favorite authors, the late, great Joseph Campbell, 
who's a cultural anthropologist, who describes the epic journey and what it means and what it's meant for thousands of years in English, uh, I'm sorry, in worldwide culture. What he says is that there is a sort of journey where a person separates themselves from their community, where they take on a new identity, where they then go through ordeals, where they experience a transformation, and then when they, where they return and describe the journey and describe the transformation and share that experience with their home community. And that description by Joseph Campbell, for me, really fits with what pilgrimage is all about because we separate ourselves from our community. We take on a new identity, which is pilgrim. Then we experience ordeals. And maybe that's blisters, tendonitis, maybe that's sunburn or all kinds of things that happen along the way in the pilgrimage. Then we have transformation that's part of all of that. And we accept a new identity. And so at the Cathedral of Santiago, there's a certificate, your name, if it applies, is in Latin, and you go back home and you share your experience. So to me, that's something that speaks very deeply about human culture and the way things change when somebody goes to the outside and has a new experience. And that's why I love the Camino Frances. That's why I love the Camino de Santiago. And that's why I think it's become more and more popular among people over these years. Even during the time that I've been involved, which my first Camino was 2008, it's about double the number of people, of course, in non-COVID years, entering into the 500,000 or so range uh, as we get to a holy year. And we'll talk a little bit more about Holy Year. Now, on this slide, you can see my book, The Cicerone Guide. Cicerone was one of the first that put together a Camino Frances guide. It was by Alison Rager. This is our second uh, version uh, after a hiatus of about 12 years. You see the cathedral and then a wonderful landscape along the way that's uh, very popular as a photo op. Next slide. Now, in this, you can see a portion of the huge number of Caminos that head towards Santiago in Spain. The one in green is the Camino Frances, but you can see that there are many others, and I should mention uh, an important one in Portugal as well. In the next slide, you can see a map of the Camino Frances, which is what we're going to talk about. If somebody says to you, they're going to walk the Camino, usually what they mean is they're going to walk the Camino Frances. So on the right-hand side, you can see just begins just inside the border at France at the little town of Saint-Jean-Pied-de-Port. And if you can look very closely, you see the major cities of Pamplona, Logroño, Burgos, León, Astorga, Ponferrada, Saria, Arzua, Santiago, and then you see this sort of Y-shaped extension, which allows you to go either to Finisterre or Moshia, because some people say that even a more ancient pilgrimage route is to the Atlantic Ocean. So in the next slide, you can see that a, a person lining up in a church, actually in Galicia, to have their credentials stamped. In the next slide shows what a full credential looks like. This is my credential from 2008. And every night you get a stamp at usually where you stay. You can also get them along the way at a church you visit or something like that as in the previous slide. And then when you get to Santiago de Compostela at the cathedral pilgrim office, they'll look at your credential and determine if you are to be awarded the Compostela certificate, which is uh, a prized possession, even though it's out of paper, because it symbolizes that you've walked at least 100 kilometers, in the case of this credential, 800 kilometers, and many people walk even farther 
to get to Santiago de Compostela. Next slide. So if you do the entire Camino Frances, you would begin in the little town of saint jean pied de port which literally means foot of the pass. It's a red roofed, white walled kind of place with mountains around it, kind of uh, mountainous weather. And in fact, you have to watch the weather when you cross the pass into Spain. Here's a picture on the right hand side of the Spanish side where you walk for a, a little bit through forest and make your way into Spain. Next slide. Now, once in Spain, you're in a mountainous area. It's really the foothills of the Pyrenees. And here's my wife who walked with me in 2018, who is about to cross the stream. And uh, pilgrims will remember this stream crossing on these sort of concrete pylons. The next slide. Here's a picture of my wife. She's the small person uh, next to the giant walls of Pamplona. And uh, this is what somebody gets used to as they're walking the Frances. These amazing medieval cities, go ahead and advance, amazing medieval cities, like this is the, uh, an, a streetscape in Pamplona that are now host to thousands of pilgrims making their way through and enjoying their delights. And Pamplona, when it's not busy with the San Fermin Festival, uh, is a great place for a pilgrim to stop and enjoy Basque culture. This is part of the Basque territory of Spain. Go ahead and continue. In this slide, uh, you climb a mountain called Alto del Perdón outside of Pamplona. And this sculpture greets you. It's one of the iconic locales on the Camino. It's put there as part of an electrification project. But it describes pilgrims from old to pilgrims in modern days. So if you were to look closely, you'd see uh, medieval pilgrims on the left, and then look on the right, you'll see pilgrims wearing backpacks, having hats on, and so on, all underneath a canopy of stars uh, from ancient and modern times. Go ahead. Yeah, and here's one of the examples of why you'd want to have a guidebook because it's possible to walk on to the town of Puente la Reina uh, or one of the towns nearby and miss the fact that there is this remarkable 12th century chapel here at a little place called Ayunate. And it's said that if you walk around inside of the archways that you see there on the right, if you walk around three times in your bare feet, and pray, then you'll receive forgiveness. It was one of the places that has been a landmark on the Camino for many years. And it's at this point that the Camino Aragonés joins the Camino Francés. That's if you had walked a southern route through France and gone over the Somport Pass. In the next slide, you can see now the territory begins to sort of broaden out. You're out of the mountains now. This is the town of Siroki, and you're in the far west of Navarre and beginning to come to La Rioja. This is also one of the iconic towns because it's a hill town that you can see for a great distance and, uh, and then, of course, surrounded as well by vineyards. Go ahead. Yeah, and then you've passed to Puente La Reina and you've come to Estea. And wine is important, and there's a uh, winemaker at Irache that gives free wine to passers-by. That includes walking, biking pilgrims, even bus tourists will stop here and have a sample. I don't think it's their finest vintage, but it is a memorable place to stop and have some refreshment along the way. And across is an ancient monastery at Irache, which is also worth the tour. Now you see that things begin to broaden out as you continue to make your way west. And this is after the town, town of Grañón. You can see there are vast grain fields here. You can continue on and uh, after this, go ahead and advance the slide. You come to the town of Los Arcos. And to me, this is funny. There's a great place 
that's a piazza with a system of arches on the church. And a lot of people stop there because it's a perfect place for a beer or a cup of coffee. Um, and they don't go into the church. If you do go into the church, it's a very dark place. And uh, I don't know how to turn on the lights, but I took out my iPhone and took a picture. And this is what came out. It's an amazing Baroque building, Santa Maria de los Arcos. And uh, your iPhone may or your smartphone may be able to capture the beauty and the decorations of this domed sanctuary space. Go ahead. Then you come to the town of Logroño. And Logroño is famous as the capital of the wine region of La Rioja. And if you have not been introduced to Spanish wines from La Rioja, you want to give them a try because they're amazing. And Logroño celebrates those with a fabulous set of alleyways that apparently once housed bordellos, but now house tapas and pincho restaurants. So at about seven o'clock, the tapas places open up and you can stroll through and get a plate of this or a plate of that, along with a glass of wine to uh, carry along in your journey. This is Calle Laurel, which is uh, one of the most famous tapas or pinchos locations in Spain. Go ahead. Now, another reason for a guidebook is you may be walking through the town of Navarrete and not notice that there's a big ancient church to your right because it's uh, squeezed up against a bunch of other buildings. But you'll want to enter it because one of the most lavish altar pieces is here in this church in Navarrete. As my wife, Teresa, walked in, she was flabbergasted with the splendor of this altar area. And uh, there's a story, of course, about where the gold came from that adds to the interest because from suffering of some people comes this amazing work of art. Go ahead and continue. Then as we come to uh, Santo Domingo de la Calzada is that iconic scene of the plains and the uh, road leading on into the distance. Almost everybody that walks to Francis has this picture. Go ahead and continue. Then you come to the town of Burgos. And this is something about the Camino Frances that I think is significant. A person had never been to Spain, and even somebody that had been to Spain and stayed in the south around Sevilla and Granada or Madrid or Barcelona may not even know about the town of Burgos. But it turns out it's an important town in northern Spain, and you can see its longtime importance by the splendor of its cathedral, this Baroque cathedral, which is mostly a museum now. There are worship services only in the left-hand building, which you can see there. It's quite remarkable. And I think one of the beautiful cathedrals, Baroque cathedrals of the world, right here on the Frances. There's a discount for entry for pilgrims. Now, the next great area you come to in the Frances is the Meseta. And here I'm looking down on Ornias del Camino, but you can see the vast terrain. Uh, at a high point, you can see for maybe 10 or more kilometers. And in the next slide, you can see what that sometimes looks like. This is a stretch after Carrion de los Condes, which is almost perfectly flat. And for the distance of 17 kilometers, there are no towns and a couple of little pop-up kind of services uh, where you can get a coffee or a beer. But it's good to be prepared for a long distance where you won't have much service and you can see what the Meseta really looks like. Some people say this is a boring stretch. Other people say this is the most rewarding stretch because of the art treasures there and because of the focus on the walking. After the town of Leon, which I hate to skip, but I need to for time, this is the town of Hospital de Orbigo, which has a picturesque bridge, which has a story of a knight and fair maidens from the Middle Ages. But then you begin the walk up the Montes de Leon. In the next slide, 
you can see uh, you can see a bar along the way in one of the towns up the hill. This is the cowboy bar. And Americans should feel especially at home here since we invented the cowboys, I guess. But uh, it's a memorable stamp and a fun place to stop. In the next slide, you can see now the territory of the Montes de Leon begins to be more rugged. And you're climbing up to a place called Cruz de Ferro. In the next slide, you can see, go ahead and advance to the next slide. You can see a foggy picture of Cruz de Ferro. And what that is, is a iron cross at the top of what looks almost like a telephone pole, standing at the top of an enormous pile of stones and debris. Well, one of the traditions of the Camino Frances is that you bring something like a rock from home and you carry it to this point where you set it at the foot of the cross. And that may bear uh, something that you want to be forgiven for, somebody who you want to remember, like somebody who has died, a relationship that's broken and you want to let go of. But the idea here is to let go. And it becomes really one of the most holy places on the Francis. Go ahead. Then it's a matter of going downhill. And you walk down this very quiet road until you come in the next slide to the town of Molina Seca, or Dry Mill. And it's the beginning of the Bierzo region, region which is the second uh, place that you want to study if you're interested in Spanish wines, because Bierzo wines are uh, rivals of La Rioja. You continue on then, and you come to the region of Galicia. And in Galicia, you have these emerald rolling hills. And this picture is taken from Osobrero. And uh, you're looking down toward the coast now, the climate is very different. It's actually, uh, whether people call it a subtropical climate because of the amount of rain, it's not hot in terms of tropical temperatures, but it's green year round because of the reliability of the rain. And you continue, next slide. And after another about 125 kilometers, you come to the beautiful Cathedral de Santiago uh, de Compostela. And this is a picture of the outside after the exterior renovations from my 2019 walk. The next picture, you can see one of the most uh, fun rituals inside, and that is at many of the noon pilgrim masses, a group of attendants will begin to swing the Bote Fumairo, which is a large incense sensor. If you extended your arms in a big circle like this, the sensor uh, would be even bigger than that. And it swings from the one transept to the next. And uh, it's quite the amazing thing. It was there originally for smelly old pilgrims in the Middle Ages. Uh, and the incense was designed to help make the odors a little bit more tolerable. And now it's a tradition uh, that we showered and shaved pilgrims still adore very much. Continuing on from Santiago, everyone has a choice to so come to this place. If you go on to go either left toward Finisterre or right toward Muxia. And my wife is uh, there behind the monuments that point the ways. In the next slide, you see, if you go to uh, Finisterre first, which I recommend, then you come to the towns of Se and Corcubion, which are both really lovely seaside towns. And then you walk along the coast and on the beach in order to get to the ancient town of Finisterre. If you go to the right, which I recommend after visiting Finisterre in the next slide, then you come to the town of Muxia. And this is the chapel of Santa Maria de la Barca, where tradition says the Virgin Mary came to help Santiago, St. James, as he was evangelizing in Spain. And both places are a great place to see a sunset and celebrate the end of your successful Camino.
that's my presentation. I look forward to Ivar's and for our questions coming up. Thank you. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. That was amazing. Um, I think it really shows how much you just adore this route. Um, and yeah, I, I'm sure that you're just desperate to get out and look it again. Yep. Time yeah. can't come quickly enough. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks Amy. Um, so we're going to move now to talking to Eva about um, kind of what it's been like in Santiago uh, during the COVID pandemic and sort of what you expect to be coming up um, with the holy year and that sort of thing. Um, mm. So, yeah, so Eva, what has it been like to live in Santiago during COVID? Um, because as you saw in Sandy's photos, it's usually really busy. Um, whereas I imagine last summer it was quite strangely quiet. It was very quiet. And uh, also as the pandemic kind of hit in February, March, uh, it was uh, interesting to see kind of pilgrims that had arrived or was about to arrive trying to book flights home and things were closing down and they had to hurry and they were all, you know, it, would, it was a bit chaotic at the beginning. And then of course, after everyone left, it was, it was, it was just quiet. And it was quiet because there was no pilgrims, and there was quiet because Spain went into lockdown uh, for the first wave. And uh, you know, we were allowed to we weren't allowed to go outside our houses or apartments except to get food and you know the basic things. Everything was closed. The things that were usually open were bakeries, pharmacies, and supermarkets. That was about it. Um, since I run an online store, uh, another thing that was open that you could have open was um, uh, um, like Amazon would still work, right? So the online stores could still go and work and fulfill their orders, which meant I was able to walk down to my little office and you know pack the orders that I got in, which means I, I could actually walk the streets back and forth every day. Uh, and and it was just weary because there was no one out. You know? yeah. But I'm sure this has been the yeah. same for everyone uh, around the world. Uh, most people have, have different versions of this, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, I'd like to share um, the photos of the inside of the cathedral now because that's one of the, um, I guess, upsides of this quiet period is that you have been able to take these amazing yes. photos you know if we're gonna give a, a cloud of silver lining sure. no, um, I was, I, i've been down there a few times and, and it's very strange because it's it's been t they're taking 10 years to fix it up and they're 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 almost done they, they say they're officially done but i still see some scaffolding here and there and they're still kind of finishing up uh, but uh you know that's the holy door that is open only in holy years which is this year and next year because the whole year was extended one year so the whole that holy door is open this year and next year and and what do you think um with the holy year do you think festivities as far as you know will be possible this summer next summer uh well so originally holy year was only going to be this year right 2021 so uh, the Shunta and the local government here in Galicia had a big budget to make uh, all kinds of concerts and events and big festivities for this year. Um, but uh, now since the Pope in Rome has said that it, uh, we could have the whole year also next year and all with all the rest travel restrictions and everything, I think the budget that they had to spend this year has been kind of moved on. Um, to next year. So I think this year, there's probably gonna not be a lot of concerts and things going on in town. It's gonna be probably moved to next year. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. I have reservations yeah. at a hotel for July 25th in Santiago. And so it's good this to year? know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. maybe I'll move well, that well, to next year. No, but July 25th, I'm sure. It depends on how Spain is at that time, but it, it it, uh, I'm sure there's going to be fire. July 25th is St. James Day, which is a big yeah. day. So that day, it's going to be fireworks and you know, festivities, I'm sure. But but that's every year. That's not only holy years, right? Yeah. So here you see a picture of the cathedral that has been renovated that they just uh, 
almost finished renovating. And you could see the new, the new benches there. The, the lighting is new and some people like it, some people don't. There was, before it was kind of dark looking up because the lighting was from the top and lighting down. Now they also have lit up as you can see. So you could see the arches. Uh, I kind of like it this way. Uh, I like it in the pictures because to me, it seems much warmer. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, yep. the bright lights before, I think, were kind of glaring. And now it seems yeah. very warm and it emphasizes the stone. Which exactly. is uh, because yeah. all the stone has been cleaned, uh, you know, it, it, and it's been cleaned. They've used 10 years to do this because, of course, you can't just do a, a power wash on, on the cathedral. You have to almost with a toothbrush, you know, go very slowly. And uh, on all the paint work that has been done, uh, at the altar behind there has been, you know, they have scaffolding all over the altar and they were doing it inch by inch, you know. So it really has been, a, they have done a really good job. Well, the pictures of the altar area are interesting because to me it seems as though the gold of the Baroque altar now sort of fits with the rest a little bit better. It seems more subtle where it was very kind of glittery and of course, you could always see the dust that had gathered on the heads of the statues and things like that. And you could see the paint was a little bit flaky, and you know, it was. You could see that it really needed some work. And now it's that's why also they shine the light up now because before, that the arches were white and they're still white, but they were flaky before because there was a lot of humidity. As you mentioned, Galita is very humid, and the humidity has really taken a toll on the paint. And now, of course, that is all new. So it looks much nicer. Yeah. Yeah, this is a side chapel, I guess. I don't recognize this. Is, do you remember, this is a new, I took a photo of this place because this is where they they had the Santiago Matamoros. There was a statue uh -huh. of the Santiago with the sword kind of, you know? Uh -huh. Yeah. So they, to, to avoid any controversy there, they actually, for a few years, just put a big, plant in front of it <laughs> uh, of the statue just to hide it because they didn't want to take it out but now okay. that they've done renovation they actually took the whole thing out and then put something else in there it's uh okay I forgot what it is now but it's an it's a new it's a new thing and you mentioned about the formator before and this is yeah. the rope when it's not in use they tie up the rope there and then they make a knot and then when they when they actually use it they they untie it here and then they they swing it yeah and this, this is, is another side, side chapel. chapel. Yeah. And actually, oh. it, this is usually closed, but the day I was there, it was open and I walked in. And it's, it's, you can't really enjoy that side chapel by looking at a photo because it's very beautiful. And you have to go in there and see. Just after restoration, it looks so much different. It looks amazing. Yeah. Even in this picture, it does look quite amazing as I mean it's mm. clear a lot of sculpture and decoration mm. and a dome yeah beautiful yeah yeah this yeah, is just I, an, an example of a statue or something on the wall that, that they've renovated and it looks looks much nicer yeah and to me it looks as though they have taken the same new treatment that they did on the Porta de Gloria and have mm -hmm. used it in some of the interior sculptures too. Exactly. Try to find the original colors, you know, if they could find it in the layers of paint. Yeah. And then apply it in, you know. Beautiful. I think I almost need a before and after photo to know uh, exactly <laughs> how, you know, because I don't have the experience of having visited, but I think it's it's beautiful, all of the yeah, renovation. Yeah. Uh, this is a great picture looking up at the dome above the chancel area and uh, seeing the arches. You know, to me, the big challenge of the Santiago Cathedral was it's a Romanesque church. And so it's not as tall or lofty or inspiring as a Gothic church. And uh, but here you see the Romanesque rounded arches and uh the pendentives and leading up to the dome which uh you know has the beautiful lantern windows above and so i i i love what's done to this and i think what more can you do to a romanesque cathedral 
than what's been done here. The lighting is so important and it's just stunning to, to see. I feel that it's more, um, it's, it's more mysterious and, um, and more sort of um, dark and beautiful than with the old um, pre-renovation lighting. Mm -hmm. There are the pipes from the pipe organ, which I don't That's know if they've organ. done any. Yeah, I don't know if they've done any work on the organ, but uh, I'm not it's sure. yeah, it's quite a quite an instrument. I know. Hmm. No, it's brilliant, and I I think it's so lovely to be able to see the renovation that has gone on, and you know the fact that pilgrims like Sandy haven't been able to go for over a year, I guess. Um, yeah. To go and see it so it's so nice to be, yeah, be able to share that um so that people know what they're kind of getting when they go to santiago um what they've got to look forward to yeah that's just amazing mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's beautiful and this is the inside of course they also fixed up the outside so it's it looks shiny and nice on the outside too because if you've been to santiago before especially if you were here a few years ago you would remember the facade of the front of the cathedral had plants and you know greens on the on the on the outside and that has all been cleaned up now and that's right some the, people yeah. some people actually don't like it they they like the old one you know because they have personalities <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah i walked into the cathedral with an american i was so embarrassed he looked up at the cathedral this was in 2011 he said wow somebody needs to pressure wash that thing <laughs> so <laughs> well very good thank you so much for sharing these slides Ibar. they're fabulous no problem no problem absolutely beautiful um so we've got uh loads of audience questions which is great but uh Ivar, i've just got a few to ask you before we okay move on to those um so yeah. you've hosted the online camino forum uh for many years and i just wondered yeah. what's the most you know common question that people ask you when they're planning their route? Uh, well, I don't think there's any one question that is the question everyone asks. It's it's very practical. It, it varies because it, it goes by phases. Uh, a lot of very practical uh, questions. How do I get from here to there? Um, any recommendation on backpacks and equipment? Um, but of course with 50, what is it? 56,000 questions, I think it is. You can get find any information you really look want uh, by just going there and using the search box at the top. I think it's just practical information. Um, how do I get from here to there? People are also reading other people's uh, experiences, trying to decide which Camino they would like to walk. Because not everyone walks the Camino Frances. There's other routes, so people use it also to try and find out what route is is the one they want to walk. And we have got um, a comment thanking you for all your efforts during the pandemic and that your weekly information has proved to be of huge importance. And um, so I just want to oh, share that with you. you. It, it's clearly thank really you. helpful. Yeah, I do a YouTube video every Monday on what's going on virus-wise. So I just want to say the same thing, Ivor, that's been a great resource for many of us. So thank you for being our insider in Santiago de Compostela these no. uh, last COVID months. No, no, thank you. No problem. Um, so almost building on that, we've got a couple of questions about um, the practicalities of the route. So when is the best time for walking the Camino to avoid the summer heat? Um, Sandy, do you want to start on that? Yeah, my favorite time to walk the Camino Frances is in the spring. And if you think about it, um, then think about the growing cycle. So in the spring, the farmers have planted the wheat and it's growing in green. In the summertime, the wheat has turned uh, and it's golden, which is also beautiful. In the fall, the wheat has been harvested and plowed under and usually is waiting then uh, for the next year's crop. So in the spring, you get lots of green colors. In the summer, you get golden colors. In the fall, you get the colors of the soil, which actually can be very colorful as well. 
The one thing, though, too, about the fall is that as you go through the areas with the vineyards, that's when the harvesting of the grapes is going to be happening. So that's a fun and interesting time to be walking as well. So spring and summer have their advantage, or spring and fall have their advantages. I think that it's okay to walk in the summer, too. I've walked in July and August, and um, Galicia is... Uh, I guess Ivor said it was going to get up to like 27 degrees Celsius, uh, which is unusual in the spring. That sounds like a summer temperature in Galicia, which is quite moderate in the summertime. And it's true that the Meseta is sunny and warm, but it's good to remember that the Meseta, which is the middle stretch, is uh, very high in altitude, about 800 meters. And so... Um, in my opinion, it's still cooler there than it is in uh, similar places in southern Spain. So a summer Camino is possible. There are more college students in a summer Camino. You just have to take better care of yourself in the warm temperatures. By the way, my solution is a trekking umbrella. So uh, people still consider it odd, but uh, I trek with a silver-coated umbrella so that I can create my own shade wherever I go. I think that's very clever, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I would say- uh, My experience also is that the, the foreigners usually walk in May and September, and Spaniards usually yeah. walk in August, because that's their vacation month. Yeah. Yeah, good. And um, question, one day I hope to walk from, is it Le Puy? Yeah. Um, do you think that three months is a sufficient time to enjoy the walk for a 70 year old regular walker? Oh, I, I would think so. I understand Le Puy, I, which I have not walked to be about 30 days. And then Saint Jean to Santiago is about 30 days. So if you're doing a 25 kilometer uh, per day amount, then three months should be more than enough time. I'm not sure about a 70-year-old walker. I've seen some pretty fast 80-year-olds and some pretty slow 35-year-olds. Um, so I think it all depends on your level of fitness and the pace that you set for yourself. What do you think, Ivar? What do you think about that? Uh, yeah, I think um, it depends on, 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 on how fit you are, I guess. Um, but... Uh, I feel I think you, you could do it in th three months. It should be it should be enough time because you have to allow for some rest days to start start slow, and then don't push it. The biggest mistake I think people do is to start pushing too hard too early. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. Um, and there's a few questions about accommodation, uh, which I think we could kind of group together. Um, so there's a general question about the accommodation on the route, which is kind of largely pilgrim hostels, isn't it? Um, but also, can you wild camp? And do you think a sleeping bag is necessary to take, like a full sleeping bag um, when you're walking in the summer or will a, seat, a silk sleeping bag liner do? Yeah, okay, let me take a stab at that and Ivor may want to add. First of all, on accommodations, after writing the guidebook, um, in which we identified all of the available accommodations. There are about 1,100 accommodations between Saint Jean and Finisterre and Mouchia. About 600 of those are albergue styles. And an albergue is basically a hostel in which there are multiple beds in a single room. But there's a transition that's happening on the Francaise right now which is more and more albergues are also offering private rooms. And even some of the group rooms are now using sleeping pods where you can pull a shade down and have privacy to yourself, although you still be using a bathroom, a uh, shared bathroom. Uh, the typical cost for a municipal albergue is somewhere between five and 10 euros. There are still donativo albergues, which are often run by parishes, 
And donate or donativo does not mean free. It means you're making a donation. Sometimes dinner is even included. And I think a donation of about 10 euros is a good amount. And add on to that if dinner is included. Um, then there are also hotels, casa rurales, and other kinds of places to stay. I prefer the albergue experience because I like the idea of being uh, in community with other people. And there are some albergues or hostels where there is an intentional ritual, a dinner that's shared in community or a religious service or something else that creates a sense of community with the people that are staying that night. And to me, that's most prized of all. The opposite of that is to check in and check out of a hotel and go to a um, commercial restaurant. And essentially, uh, you're much more isolated because you're not meeting people and rubbing elbows with them as you're uh, enjoying your overnight and your meals. Um, then as far as whether to have a uh, sleeping bag or not, I always bring a light sleeping bag and a silk liner. And uh, the sleeping bag is quite light, but I'll tell you there have been a few times at high elevation that I've been happy, even in the summertime, to have a sleeping bag. I'm thinking of Osebrero uh, in August, where the temperature was down uh, in an August night to maybe something like five to 10 degrees. And when somebody opens the window, which I hope they do when there's 100 people sleeping at the Osborough uh, Municipal, then uh, it can get drafty. I unzip my sleeping bag and use it as a comforter and uh, have my um, sleeping bag liner uh, in addition to that. I think I covered the questions that I could remember. But maybe Ivor. I know has, I asked you a lot in one go. <laughs> yeah, maybe Ivor has uh, anything to add. The only other question was about wild camping. Oh, oh yeah. Um, so Ivor, Ivor, do you I want to talk about that? The camping. Uh, I know people. Many people that I see on the forum um, that plan on bringing a tent and that start to bring a tent. Most of them end up sending it ahead to Santiago, and not use it because. If, so, because if you're, like you said, there's a communal uh, experience when you walk and in the afternoon you're together with all pil pilgrims, you meet up at the albergue. And if you're on your own in a tent, you'll, you'll lose that. And people miss that, I think, uh, sometimes. And don't think about that when they make plans for tents. Yeah. Um, so I, is what, this is one of the questions that is also asked a lot on the forum. So uh, I would maybe do a search there as well, just to see what, what's been said, because uh, there's a lot of topics on that question. Yeah. I, I do know people also that want to have a night outside. And it's occasionally the case that albergues in rural areas might have a lawn. And so it's easy to pull your uh, sleeping sack and sleeping bag out on the lawn and have a night under the stars. Uh, and there are some formal campgrounds where you can uh, pitch your tent. But I agree with Ivar that most people, because hostels are inexpensive, um, because of the community life, um, decide not to camp ultimately. I think that's, that's really helpful. Um, the next thing I want to ask about is there's quite a few questions about what to expect either this year or you know when can people actually travel and do this Camino um, mm -hmm. and I know that you know neither of you are making that decision um, because you tell everyone there already um, but yeah so what's your best guess for the possibility of Spain opening uh, this is to Canada later in the summer or early fall um, or yeah you know a vaccine passport's going to be a thing, um, what's kind of knowledge at the moment that we have? Ivar is the one to answer that. I consider him the unofficial expert on this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm the one that knows 
as much as you do, really. But uh, you know, since I live here, it's I've been looking at this, and it looks like I was just reading the El País today, and this afternoon it, because right now Spain is in a state of emergency, right? State of emergency was created, was set up in November, the second one, and it's going until May 9th. They had to make a state of emergency in Spain because otherwise they couldn't make the law prohibiting Spaniards from moving freely within, within their own country. So to be able to block people from traveling from one area to another, which we can't do right now, they had to make a state of emergency so they could make that law. And now at the end, this state of emergency we're in now, it's going to end May 9th so, or May 8th, May 8th or 9th. So starting from May 10th, uh, and I read on the paper today that the president of Spain said he's not going to renew the state of emergency. He's not thinking of renewing it after May 9th. And that means that when May 10th comes around, it looks like Spaniards can at least move freely within the country. Uh, and if you think about that uh, compared and also think about that right now, Schengen, which is uh, the area within, not everyone is in Schengen, but it, you can think of it as the, the, a big area of a lot of, most of the European countries are in Schengen. It is possible to travel within Schengen now. I know there was a question about the UK, UK is not in Schengen, so that's a separate thing. And from Canada, Canada of course is not in Schengen either, but within Schengen, it should be possible to travel to Spain and walk after May 10th. I mean, with all precautions and you know, but it, that's Fingers kind of what crossed. it looks like. Exactly, that's what it kind of looks like now. Uh, there's also saying that he's saying that they will have vaccinated 33 million Spaniards uh, at the end of August. Okay. So, because so thirty, how many Spaniards do we have? I think it's what forty million people. Mm -hmm. So thirty-three million. That's that's seventy percent, isn't it? Yeah. So it's the end of August. So we're in that June, July, August area where I think people could maybe be able to travel. Um, and of course, I think the EU has said that they will have this passport, the vaccination passport, up and running by June. I think. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you don't have the vaccine, uh, I think after May, if you're in EU, you could travel to Spain. And then when you go back home, you may have to do the PCR test and you have to, to self-quarantine and all of that uh, if you don't have the vaccine. Uh, but that's what it looks like. Uh, mm -hmm. so, and well, did you say yeah. earlier that I'm thinking of, of Sandy here and his you know, fellow Americans, um, and when they'll be able to come to Spain. Did you say earlier I July? That's, it, that's an like, EU thing, I think, you know, because I think the EU needs to decide when they will let people from outside the EU in. And yeah. I, I don't know. I, but I, my, my gut feeling, without having any knowledge, is my gut feeling it's going to be around July, that area. Mm -hmm. And then just for the audience who are also wondering this, we've got a um, an article on the Cicerone website about, uh, or various articles about when you can travel to certain countries um, and when you can do certain pilgrimage routes, which we are keeping updated. And mm. um, so it should be on there when things change. Good. Mm -hmm. You know, Eva, based on what you've been saying, I guess, um, and what I've heard as well, it just seems to me that summer may be possible but is sort of pushing it a little bit and in america i think we're a little bit ahead of the eu in terms of vaccinations so we might not understand that it's a couple months or that, that spain is a couple months slower as well as the rest of the eu and we may want to kind of force it a little bit but um june july and into August are, are probable. But then as we look at September, it just seems to me that the vaccinations all throughout are gonna have proceeded that much farther. And September mm -hmm. looks like, to me, it looks a little more reliable 
Would you agree with that? Yes, I would say September and on is most likely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. June, Ju July, it's maybe. Yeah. Because if okay. we can get the 33 million vaccinated people by the end of August uh, in Spain, that means Spain is fine. Yeah. Uh, it depends on, and I think also the Euro European Union. It, we're, I think we're, we're, we're European Union has been very slow in, in getting vaccines, but I think we're we're walking in lockstep the whole union, which means yeah. if Spain is vaccinated by August, I think the rest of the European Union as well will be. So yeah. I think that's about the time I think when the EU might think about opening up. Yeah, and this Very is good. all. All this information is you know, as far as we know, isn't it? And the situation at the moment know, and things can change. Guessing, and, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a question. Um, do you anticipate that some of the communal nature of the Camino might change because of concerns around the virus, which I think is quite an interesting question. Um, Cause Sandy, you talked, and Eva as well, you've both talked about how that communal aspect is one of the most important things. Um, so do you see that? changing in the future you know i'll take a try at this i think that um some people have talked about the density of albergue housing maybe being reconsidered um you know and there are a few places where there are 75 or 100 people in a room all sleeping at night in their individual bunk beds with fairly little ventilation. And I do wonder if somebody in a health department or health authority is some, somewhere along the way going to say, maybe we don't want to do that uh, quite that way anymore. Um, but at the same time, it's hard to see that the basic nature of the Camino would be changing. And that's walking every day, meeting people, experiencing these amazing sights, and being transformed and coming back home to tell about it. Ivar, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think I think it's. Uh, I don't think it's going to change much uh, in a year or two from now. You know, maybe the first few pilgrims that walk will will see. Uh, People that are a bit worried, you know, seeing foreigners coming in and um, walking. But I, I think, and also I think maybe more people want to choose to do um, private lodging, right, instead of the, the albergues. Uh, they may choose a hotel or a, or a pension, uh, staying by themselves instead of doing the albergue. But uh, yeah. I, I, f I have a feeling that in a year or two, we're going to be back to normal, especially if we could all get vaccinated and get the virus under control. And if, if that's not uh, a threat, uh, I think people will um, will continue doing you know, and having all these experiences that they've had for yeah. many, many, many years. Uh, yeah, they will people have continue having those experiences. Yeah, people have said the Camino has survived a thousand years and it's going to be back and it will be there for us and for our kids and grandchildren too. And it's also a thing that you're outside most of the day walking in the, you know, outside. So virus yeah. wise, you're pretty safe. I was up in the north of Lugo uh, over Easter and we were there for four days and it was up in the mountains and, you know, we saw maybe I saw maybe four people, except for my family, every day. There was no one there. I mean, we were way up there. And it was just like normal. It, you could actually not think about the virus for a few for a few days almost, right? Because uh, yeah. it's, it's very, very freeing when to be out in the nature like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think we're almost out of time, sadly. Um, but I just, there's one final question. Um, do you think the Camino has lost its true essence as a pilgrimage? Does it feel more like a hiking trail now? Um, I feel like you're going to say no, that that's not the case, especially you, Sandy, <laughs> after everything you said at the beginning. But I just wanted to ask that. Um, I, of our questions. I, I think you get out of the Camino what you put into it. So if you're looking for a religious experience, 
then that's what you find. If you're looking for spiritual experience, that's what you'll find. If you're looking for recreation, that's what you'll find. And um, so prepare also to be surprised. You may find your categories expanding based on the experience. But I think it's hard to walk 800 kilometers or 500 miles and not be transformed. And then to experience some of these great sites and to participate in this ancient tradition, I feel like I'm walking in the footsteps of the thousands of pilgrims and millions of pilgrims that have done this since you know the 10th century. So uh, if you bring that to it, the Camino really can never, can never change. It will always be what it is. I feel almost, it, 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 I feel it's always, look at it another way, it's almost always changing just a little bit, right? Because it's, if Camino walking now is very, very different from walking it 100 years ago or 200 years ago or 500 years ago, right? Now people take airplanes home. What, what kind of a Camino is that? You take the plane home, you only walk there, and then you, you take the plane home. You know, before they used to walk here and then they walked home. So, you know, if you think about someone that had been walking to and from Santiago and ask him, is, has the Camino changed? Is it yes, <laughs> a lot. Yeah. You only yeah. walk halfway. <laughs> so I think yeah. it's always changing a little bit, right? But uh, as you said, Sandy, whatever you put into it, it's what you're going to get out of it. And, you know, you really, you make a good point that there, are, like when you bring your smartphone on your Camino, and you have your earphones listening to your music, you know, from back home, then that's a lot different experience than even 30 years ago when you didn't have a giant computer in your hand. So mm -hmm. I think it does take some intentionality uh, to recreate or to create the experience. So I hope that people will be open to what it has to offer because what it has to offer is powerful. And, and as I see and talk with people, it's a life changing experience. I think that's a perfect yes. place. Yeah. To end this event. Well, welcome. Welcome to Santiago, everyone. When this <laughs> is over, come visit. Amen. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm, I'm sure people will be absolutely desperate. Um, to come and see you, Eva, in Santiago and see the new cathedral. Um, and I'm sure Sandy is going to be there as soon as he is physically allowed. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you both so much uh, for joining me for this event. It's been absolutely wonderful. Um, and yeah, I hope our audience have enjoyed it and found it um, inspiring and useful. And yeah, fingers crossed, people can go traveling again fairly soon. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, sister. No, thank you. Thank you. And um, so you can find out um, more about our upcoming events um, on the Cicero website. And you can also sign up to our newsletter and find us on social media um, at Cicero Press. Join our Facebook group, Cicero Connect. There's also a, a Cicero Camino Facebook page, which is um, Camino specific and there's lots of great information on there um, and yeah um, our next event is with uh, Paul Rose and John Fleetwood talking all about the um, new scrambles in the Lake District book and um, so that's really exciting and that will be on the 4th of May 2021 and um, so you can join us then and all the information for that is on the Cicero website um, yeah so thank you thank you for joining us this evening um, and if you want to use the discount, Santiago25 on the Cicero website. Um, and yeah, we hope to see you soon. Thank you so much.